Our next speaker is Babak Asibi from Caltech. Thank you, Richard. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, today I'm going to talk about um, crowdsourcing for clustering. Now, um, this talk kind of, um, there is decision making in it. I'm not so sure how real time um, the decisions here have to be. Um, and so when I was putting this talk together, I was actually originally thinking of doing another talk. Um, then when I saw Leonard giving the talk before me, um, I thought I probably should not tread on his toes. Um, I was thinking of talking about tree codes and their use and control and things like that. And given that he didn't talk about control at all, maybe I, I should have done that. Um, but on the other hand, this is a talk where I get to show pictures, and I very rarely get to show pictures, and so I'll use that as an opportunity. But I will do one thing now that I, I think about this. Um, um, so I'm going to start off with a question unrelated to this talk that maybe I'll answer at the end of the talk. And had I given the other talk that I'm not giving today, I would have built it around this question. Um, and so this is, again, something that comes up, I think, if you think of trying to do um, you know, communication control together, if you have noisy channels and you're trying to con control some plant and you have to make decisions in real time, problems of this type um, uh, um, come up. And so let me just ask this question. So let's suppose I have some signal, say S, and let's think of it as being some random variable. Um, and what I know, say that it's, I don't know, zero mean, and maybe it has some unit variance, okay? And it's a variable I want to convey to you, okay? So maybe it's the output of a plant I'm measuring, and I want to convey it, but I get to convey this over some noisy channel, something similar to what Leonard was talking about. And I'll take a simple case where we have something called the AWGN channel. I'm sure almost all of you have heard about this, which basically... Gaussian missing, the additive white Gaussian noise channel, which means what you measure is, say, something like this. So this V will be normal 0, 1. Um, the square root SNR here is to signify that, you know, this measurement has SNR given by some value SNR, 10 dB, 5 dB, 2 dB, whatever. Um, so you get a no noisy version of the noise, of, of the signal. Um, and so often what happens is um, if you think again in a control scenario, you might have a particular baud rate at which you're measuring the output of the plant. So maybe every second you get an opportunity to look at the plant and you ha get this signal S, but your communication rate might be different. You know, in the simplest case, you might communicate S every time you make a measurement, but often communication can be done at a higher rate. So you might have, let's, in, this, in, in a, the next simplest case, assume that we have two channel uses available. Um, so I have this one random variable, but I get to do two transmissions across this channel, um, say Y1 with noise V1, um, and Y2 with um, noise V2, which are, say, independent. And so most people would think if I get two channel uses, then what I would transmit is I would take the signal, I would transmit it twice, and then I would add up the result. The signal would add up coherently. The noise would add up non-coherently. And so this would mean that my SNR goes from SNR to twice the SNR, um, or we get a 3 dB gain. And this is, by and large, what is always done. Um, and again, this is real time. There's no coding going on, nothing like that. I have a single random variable to convey. I get two channel uses, um, and I can get two SNR. And so the question I want to ask, and I'll let you think about it, and some of you might know the answer, is can we do better? And um, as I said, I could build a whole talk around this question, and I'll give you the answer maybe at the end. Um, so that's the real-time part of my talk, and now I'll talk about my talk. Um, okay, so as I said, I'll talk about crowdsourcing for clustering. I'll talk mostly about algorithms. I've written information theoretic lower bounds in the title, but I won't really talk about information theoretic lower bounds. 
not because I don't have them, but because I'm not proud of them. Um, so I won't show them to you. Um, and this is joint work with, with my graduate students, current and former, in particular, uh, Ramya. Okay, so I'm going to look at clustering. And as I'm sure all you know, clustering is the problem. It comes up in, you know, say, pattern recognition. And um, in essentially what you have is you have data points and you want to, you know, um, put them into sets that are kind of similar so you can understand things better. In the classical setting, you know, this data was often given to you as points in some Euclidean space. So, you know, you'd have a vector and maybe the components were certain features. And, you know, you wanted the points that were close together to be uh, clustered together. And there's many algorithms. We heard k-means, um, one of the questions earlier today. And so that's an example. However, m nowadays, you know, one encounters, you know, different types of data structures. And one that comes up a lot is not so much where, you know, you have a collection of points, but rather what you have is a graph and the nodes um, are your data points, but they're really nodes of a graph. They're not, there's no Euclidean space sitting behind them. There's many examples of this, social networks is, is a prime example. A lot of networks that come up in um, biology, such as gene expression networks, are similar. And here, when we're talking about clustering, it's not so much trying to identify nodes that are you know, geometrically close to each other, but rather trying to find ones that are more connected to one another. Um, now, if you um, kind of think about this problem a little bit, um, uh, in contrast with, with you know, when you have points where there's really end data points, here a graph is really described by its edges. And so we can have up to n choose two edges. And so there's really, uh, if you think the size of the data here is, is, is quadratic in the number of, of nodes. Um, and so in many applications, um, it's often too expensive to measure all possible edges in the network. Sometimes you have to do experiments. If, it, if these are biological networks and you're looking at the interaction of, say, two particular genes, how they're expressed, you may need to do an experiment you know, involving those two. And that is often impossible to do for all combinations. Again, in a social network, maybe you won't know all the, the connections and so on. And I'll, I'll give examples in a moment. And so often what we want to do is not just cluster based on the entire graph, but a graph where we only partially observe things, where many, perhaps most of the edges are, are missing. Okay, so we often need to cluster based on a very sparse subset of this underlying graph. Okay, so the task is to identify clusters in a graph with possible missing data and to develop algorithms that have provable guarantees. Okay, so when I talk about provable guarantees, you know, clustering is kind of a you know, vague notion. What do I mean by a cluster? So we'll, we'll describe generative models for um, graphs that we'll be looking at and we'll try to um, give results for those, or mathematical results for those generative models. Uh, now who knows whether those generative models correspond to anything in reality. And so I'll also show you a lot of empirical results. Okay. But let me start off with a simple idea, which is a toy example. So suppose I have a graph like this and just visually it looks like this is three clusters. Okay. And so this is the adjacency matrix. Now, um, you know, the idealization of these clusters would have been to say, well, perhaps really, you know, it would be nice if what I had or ideal was not this kind of cluster thing, but actually three disjoint cliques, right? So uh, think of this. And when you have three disjoint cliques, the adjacency matrix has this, you know, if you label the nodes in the right way, of course, um, has these blocks of all ones, these rank one blocks. Um, so I'm assuming every node is connected to itself, so I have ones on the diagonal. And so a graph that, say, consists of three clusters kind of looks like this, except, you know, uh, if you look at this thing here, it's not a perfect clique, so there's zeros, and, you know, there's connections between the clusters, so it's not all zero down here. You have occasional ones. But it looks something like, you know, the adjacency matrix looks something like the adjacency matrix of a set of disjoint cliques. So, uh, yes. Question? Sure. How was the noisy um, toy example generated from the ideal 
I'll talk much more about that in a moment. This is just motive. This is just cartoons. I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. Um, I'm just trying to motivate the idea. The idea that we'll be using is to take the adjacency matrix of the graph, if we observe all of it, if we don't, then we'll have to do something else, and try to decompose it into a low rank component and a sparse one. The low rank component will represent the clusters by essentially placing a clique on top of all of them, connecting everything within a cluster. And the leftover, which is you know, the edges that were missing from cliques or the edges that were connected between clusters will end up in this sparse component. So that's the idea. Um, and so if I had to write an algorithm, this is what I would write. You know, given the adjacency matrix A, decompose it into low rank component plus a sparse component, where I guess both of these are 0, 1. Well, L is a 0, 1 matrix, S is a 0, plus 1, minus 1 matrix. Um, and minimize, say, this objective, the rank, because I want the rank of L to be low, some regularizer times the support of S because I want the number of you know, non-zero entries in S to be small. Okay? Of course, no one can solve this. Um, it's an integer program. Um, the only thing I want to say about this is that the rank of L, of course, determines the number of clusters. And so what to do? Um, nowadays, you know, people want to convexify everything, so we'll do that. Um, so the rank will convexify with the nuclear norm, the sum of the singular values of, of the matrix, L in this case. And the sparsity we will relax to the L1 norm, the sum of the absolute values of the entries of the matrix S. And again, L previously was between 0 and 1. Excuse me, it was, it was previously either 0 and 1, and I'll relax that to lie in the interval 0 and 1. Okay, so this is very intuitive. It's a relaxation. All it requires is knowledge of the adjacency matrix. And so you can run this and see what happens. And so incidentally, this idea is not new. It perhaps first appeared in, in work by Candes and others. Um, Candes was not interested in clustering. He was interested in robust PCA. And so suggested a similar decomposition in the PhD thesis work of Venkat Chandrasekharan, where he was looking at trying to find latent variables in um, graphical models he also required a similar decomposition. In the context of clustering, um, this was first used, I guess, by Jalali and Sangavi and Ames and Vavasis. Um, and we've done some work, which I'll um, talk about in a moment. OK, so to your question, yes. So just a modeling question. Yes. What's the motivation behind the, having the low rank piece explicit? I mean, in some sense, the, the, the fact that you're paying for the connections between the clusters is just sort of as from an optimization point of view also going to sort of determine the correct number of clusters. Um, so it, it's even, I mean, one would think that in most applications, if anything, that, that's also a second order kind of phenomenon rather than a first order phenomenon. I know you're waiting it by the lambda. Um, no, so so you would, your, your suggestion is to just include this? Not so this care is about the studied one? in the theoretical so CSS correlation. Oh, I see. Correlation okay. And, 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 and so it turns out, and I'll show in the analysis, there is a particular value of lambda which, at least for the generative models that we will look at, performs the best. Um, and, and, and the rank of L kind of helps us to identify the number of clusters, as we'll see in a moment. Um, but, but I haven't looked at the case where, where you drop L altogether. Um, so again, many of you are probably familiar with this model. So this is the generative model on which I'm going to base the analysis on. Again, who knows if this generates anything in reality. Um, it's called the stochastic block model. It's kind of a generalization of erdos any random graphs where you take two nodes and you just connect them with, you know, IID with some fixed probability P. Here what you do is you have your N nodes. They're already separated into, say, K disjoint sets, which will you know, be the clusters. And so the way I generate a, an instance of a graph from a particular stochastic block model is for each cluster, there's an associated probability PI, which is the probability that nodes within the cluster are connected. Okay, so there's capital K of these because there's K such clusters. 
And then there's a second probability, Q, which is the probability that I you know, connect one cluster to the next. And you can have more elaborate models where these are QIJs, but let me not do that. Um, and the only assumption really is that you need more connections within clusters than outside, and so you want all of these PIs to be bigger than Q. Okay? So this is, for example, what a realization of such a, a graph would look like. Um, now, in addition, I'm going to add one more twist, or maybe two more. Um, I'm only going to partially observe this graph, and I'm going to do that randomly too. So in other words, um, each edge in the stochastic block model will be independently observed with some probability r. Okay? And finally, you know, I'm also going to leave some wiggle room for outliers. So this is, uh, you know, I have k clusters, ni is the number of nodes in cluster i. So these are the nodes that are in clusters. That's the total number of nodes, and I'll have some outliers. The theory will allow for those. Yeah. Is that I also, so when I say what I observe is I look at a pair of nodes, and I observe whether there is an edge or not. Okay, so that's what I know. Um, what I don't know is for other pairs, so pairs that I do not observe, I don't know whether there's an edge or not. So is, is this a uniform probability? What happens if the clusters are relatively small? I'll, I'll get to all of that. Never observe them. Any edges that depends on what R is. Sorry? It depends on what R is, um, and again, what the cluster sizes are, but I will come to that. I mean, the cluster sizes will, will play a big role I mean, in, in, in the analysis that I will do. In particular, the, the smallest clusters will be important. But most of the analysis that I will do will be for constant PQR, um, although some of it can be extended. But. So let me just show you the performance of this naive convex program. Okay. Um, so this is an example. It's a network with 600 nodes, no outliers, three clusters of equal size. Q was taken to be 0.1. Lambda was taken to be this value, which turns out to be order-wise the optimal value to take. I'll talk about it a little bit later. And so what I'm showing you here is the success rate. Success here is, is a very strong notion of success. It means that we identify L perfectly. In other words, L breaks up perfectly into these sub-matrices of block size 1. And I'm looking at the probability of success as I increase P. So Q is fixed. And here, as you can see, you know, if things are not working, once P picks up above 0.6, then with high probability you succeed. The only difference with the pro program I showed, and maybe I had that there, is my constraint, of course, because I'm not seeing all of the matrix. I only have this equality over the observed parts of it. And so this observed, to your question, can have zeros and ones. Um, now, if you think about this program, it's pretty clear that you know, if, if P min, if the smallest of these PIs is below 1 half, there's no chance it can succeed. Because if I have a cluster for which less than half the edges are present from the clique, it's always beneficial for me to declare it to 0 and push everything here into S. Okay, and so you're kind of seeing that. So this is already not a very good program, I mean, depending. I mean, there are situations where perhaps p min is bigger than 1 half. And I'll talk about that when I do the empirical stuff. But certainly for things like social networks, this is not the case, right? So if you think of social networks, say, of, of university students in the US, maybe they're clustered based on universities, and Berkeley could be a cluster. I'm pretty sure PI for Berkeley is not one half. Every Berkeley student doesn't know half of all the other Berkeley students. Um, but I'll come back to how to go around that. OK, so let me show you um, the result that we can prove for the stochastic block model for the simple algorithm I just described. An important quantity that comes up is what we call the effective density, or the minimum effective density which is this quantity here. You minimize over all the clusters, the product of R, which is the probability of observing an edge. Ni is the size of the cluster. 2pi minus 1, which really is saying how close pi is to 1 half, which was this critical ratio that we had. And again, it turns out, so there's a certain value for lambda, um, which is this. If d min is above this, you succeed. If it's below it, you fail with high probability. I won't give you the formulas. They're complicated. 
Instead, I'll kind of show you the consequence of rewriting those formulas. So you get success. So this is a su sufficient condition for success. This inequality has to hold. So this is kind of my minimum effective density. So this has to be bigger than what's over here. Now these terms have interpretations. This is kind of like a noise term coming from how connected the different clusters are to one another. It involves the Q, and this is kind of the variance of a Bernoulli Q uh, random variable. Um, this also has an interpretation that I won't go into. But, but the bottom line is that if you take Q and R and PIs as constant, well, this stuff over here behaves like root n. Okay? And so really what it's saying, again, if R and P and everything is constant, that, that the minimum cluster size has to be bigger than root n for, for these things to succeed. Um, we also have a failure condition, which is this, and it's not absolutely tight. Um, but at worst, I think there's a factor of four um, between these. But the root n is really what's coming up. I won't go through the proof. Um, not that that was a proof anyway in one slide, but um, not even a hint of the proof. It, I mean, it's just we look at the KKT conditions and sweat and work hard. Okay, so here's a simulation result just to show you things. So here I'm plotting, um, so black means, I guess, um, failure, white means success. Here I have the observation probability R, and here I have the minimum cluster size. P is fixed to 0.85, Q to 0.1, N to 600. Um, and as you see, as the minimum cluster size gets small, it becomes harder to, for this thing to work, and these are the upper and lower bounds. Um, and that's the actual, if you think, performance. So there clearly is some kind of a phase transition. Okay, um, so that's fine. The problem, as I said, with, with the simple program was that if P is less than one half, it'll take those not very well connected clusters and preferably push them all into S. And so the simplest idea to get around that is to insist that this part you know, have a sum that's at least something, right? So if you have an idea of what the total cluster size is or a lower bound on it, and one can often observe this from the data itself, you can insist on this, okay? Um, and so this works when provided, you know, all you really need is for p min now to be bigger than q. Um, but other than that, it's the exact same program we had earlier. If I take the simulations we had for 600 nodes, each of size 200, so three clusters, Q to 0.1, and I run the success rate versus P, so the probability of connection within a cluster, this one works for much smaller P, so it picks up as soon as you hit 0.3. So it's, it's certainly uh, an improvement over the, the other program. Okay, and again, I won't go through it. There's a similar theorem for this one as well. Um, these expressions look a little different. The root n is still there. The big difference is here, what we have is previously pi was compared to 1 half, now it's compared to q. Okay, so as long as you're above q, there's some wiggle room for ni. Okay. Um, this is a more complicated program and so we don't have, you know, um, a sufficient condition for failure here. Let me mention a few things about related works. Um, so the convex algorithm, the first one I described, the one you know, which doesn't penalize you know, or put a constraint on how many non-zeros L should have was first introduced by Sangavi and co-workers. And their analysis had a result like this. So our analysis basically cleaned up this log n. Now, I know some people don't care about log n's and they say in practice it doesn't matter and that's probably true. Um, but I think log n's matter to people who know how hard it is to remove them. Um, so it matters to me now it does because it took a while. Um, there's other results on spectral clustering which I won't talk about. One connection I do want to make is to the planted clique problem. So the planted clique problem is this problem where you have an erdos reni random graph. Those things are, you know, connected randomly, and you go and you plant a clique inside. So you take some subset of the nodes and you connect them all together. And the question is, can you, in a computationally efficient way, find this clique? 
And so there's, con there's conjecture saying you can't do better than root n um, if you want computational efficiency. And so Deshpande and Montanari have a 2014 paper where they work really hard with a specific convex program uh, specifically for the planted clique and they show n min has to be bigger than 0.6 root n. If you take our result, which is much more general because we have clusters and so on and outliers, but just plug in the parameters for the planted clique, we get 2 root n, which is not too shabby given that, you know, we weren't looking at this planted clique problem even. Um, just to show, so our analysis is not too bad, I think. And it's good. it extends to much more general things than just the planted clique. So here's a simulation result for that. And so let me, so that's kind of the theory part. Well, if, the, if that was theory. Um, let's now do the fun part. Okay, so why were we interested in this and why is the word crowdsourcing in the title of this talk? Okay, so what we were interested in was the following problem of trying to label data. Okay, so suppose you have and you want to generate labeled data say for some supervised learning task. Okay, so let's suppose we have some database of images of say dog breeds. So this is a Norfolk Terrier, this is a Toy Poodle, this is a Bouvier, de, I don't know, whatever, Flandre or something. Um, now, if you have an expert and you show him this picture, you know, it'll be able, he'll be able or she'll be able to tell you what breed this dog is. But most, if you don't have that expert, you ask me, this is a dog. Um, uh, and so, is there a way that we can somehow crowd, use crowdsourcing to generate these, these labels? And so, the approach we took was that even though most people won't be able to look at a picture of a dog and identify the breed. You can give them simple tasks. For example, comparisons they can do, pairwise comparisons. Are these the same breed or not? Probably not. Um, and so on, right? And so if you think of um, the way to do this, and so we looked at, you know, we took, say, Stanford's dog database. We took 473 images of dogs of these three different breeds. Um, and so you can think of a, you know, um, a graph where, you know, every dog in the same breed is connected to all the other, say, poodles or, or whatever. So there's these disjoint cliques. Um, but what you observe is not this, but rather noisy versions of the edges. So you can ask random people, you can show them a pair of images and ask them, you know, whether they think they're connected or not, whether they're the same breed. Um, and so since you'll get a noisy response, um, you'll get some indication of whether they're the same breed, but you know, not exactly. And furthermore, you know, even with a database with 473 dogs, I don't know, 473 choose two apparently is 111,000. You can't really query 111,000 pairs of images. And so in the experiments that we did on Amazon Mechanical Turk, we had workers come in see 30 pairs of randomly chosen images and answer the question we had earlier, whether these are the same breed or not. And we observed about 15% of the edges, which is 16,000 pairs of images. And so the question is, can we identify that there were actually three different breeds? Uh, okay. And so this kind of fits the model that we have. So um, it's hope, something like a stochastic block model, because if I show you images of things that are the same breed, hopefully the chances that you'll realize they're the same breed is more than the chance of making a mistake, and so your p is, say, bigger than q. And so we did this, and it turned out that the workers had about 24% error. So a quarter of the time they would make a mistake if they were shown to the question of whether these are from the same breed or not. Okay, so these are the empirical examples. So 473 images, three clusters, these are the cluster sizes. Um, we saw 15% of the entire graph. The probability of making an error if two things were not the same breed was about 20%. The probability of correctly labeling, or not labeling, but identifying images that are of the same breed are these three values. So poodles were hard to tell, I guess, than the other two. Um, okay, and so you can take these numbers and plug them into our theorem, assuming that there's a stochastic block model behind all of this. And you quickly realize that, uh, you know, the theorem says that it shouldn't work. Um, 
In fact, it turns out that for the theorem to, to, uh, to show that it works, we need about three times as many images to see. Nonetheless, we ran the algorithm, even though we were guaranteed a failure. Um, and so this is what we got here. And so the reason why this is failure, so you can kind of see the three clusters, but of course there's errors. More so in the poodles than the other ones. But already it does something of a job, and so let me numerically show you what it does. So had you taken the pairwise comparisons and fed them to k-means, so the columns of the adjacency matrix, you would have made 193 errors out of, I don't know, 470 images. If you run the convex program and then take its output, which is this, and give that to k-means, you go down to 34 errors. If you do spectral clustering on its own, spectral clustering works well in this case, only gives 19 errors, because if you look at the spectrum of the adjacency matrix, you see the three dominant eigenvalues. But if you run the improved program to recover L uh, and then apply spectral clustering to it, you only get 13 errors, and that's because it really cleans up the eigen distribution. So, so you can you lambda here? Lambda is, is uh, one over root n. Done once, uh, priori. Yeah, that's just done once. Yes. Um, and so you're down to 13 errors, which is like below 3% errors, um, which is nice. Okay. Um, so this makes it so we really crowdsourced, and apart from 3% errors, we're able to label or at least identify the clusters. And then if you show an expert just one image, they'll say this is a poodle, this is a Bouvier de Flandre, or whatever. Okay. So the next question I want to ask is, what can we do beyond pairwise comparisons? Um, you see, because often what we're given is we're constrained by a given budget. So when we were doing this Amazon Mechanical Turk experiments, I told Ramya that you have 500 bucks to do this. Okay? She, she had to figure out you know, what to charge the workers and what to query and how many queries. Um, and so it's not clear if you have a fixed budget whether edge queries are the best thing to do. So I want to investigate triple queries, or what I'll call triangle comparisons, where I'm going to show people three images. And I want to look at the clustering performance in this case. And I also, what will be important, because I'm giving a budget to her, the cost of the query will be important. A three images is a more complicated query, and so it should cost more. Um, so let's look at triangle queries for a second. So in triangle queries, I show three images. And they need to identify which of these belong to the same breed. And so there's really only five possible answers. They're either, you know, these are all the same breed, or these two are, these two are, these two are, and none of them are. You have three forbidden responses. These are forbidden. Is that clear why? Right, because if this, you know, because of the associativity of being the same breed, right? If these are poodles and these are poodles, that had to be a poodle. Um, so there's really five responses. And uh, I guess the answer here is skip always. Um, okay, and so for this, we, in addition to dogs, we looked at birds. Um, and so this is a Caltech database now. And so there was an albatross. I don't know what terns are, but apparently there's such a bird. Um, <laughs> an Arctic version and a least version. We had a cardinal, um, a green jay, and we threw in some other birds as outliers. So these are hard to tell, right? The only difference I can see is really the beak color, and I don't know if that's consistent. But there were, anyway, 340 images, these five clusters and outliers, um, 50 or so outliers. And so the edge query is just, you know, are these the same breed? The triangle query, you see three images, and you're asked, are these all the same species? Is only one and two the same species? Only one and three, only two and three, or none? So these are the five possible answers. Okay, and so let's kind of think whether this triangle stuff will help or not. Now, whenever you do a quiangle, triangle query, okay, so for example, if I do T-independent edge disjoint triangle query, so these are triangles that don't have any edges between them, you're really seeing three T edges, you're querying three T edges, but they're dependent edges, right? They're not independent ones. Um, and you can take these edges and put them in this adjacency matrix, partially fill it, and you can run the convex program and see what happens. And so if you recall, this was the condition for success, you know, if I had a certain model with R as the, number, as the probability of observing an edge, and T, E, and Q, E, the probability of success, uh, I mean, of there being an edge within a cluster and between clusters. 
If you have triangle queries, you'll get a similar result. The only difference is R has to be replaced by RT, so the fraction of edges I see when I do tri triangle queries. I have to replace these with PT and QT, so this is the probability of there being an edge when I do triangle queries. It could be different from PE. Um, the only difference really that shows up here is this factor of three down here. And that's really because when you do triangle queries, they're not independent edges that you see, so you pay a price and that's the price. So one minus one third is kind of, you know, bigger than this, so this lower bound goes up. That's the, pro that's the price you pay for not seeing independent queries. Okay, so I have that written down. And so the bottom line is that if with triangle queries you have the same number of observations of edges, and if the probability of observing a correct edge and making a mistake on the edge doesn't change, triangle queries are worse because we're not seeing independent ones. So you might ask why do triangle queries? The reason is these assumptions are not true. Okay? So when you do triangle queries, it often happens that P of T gets better than PE and QT gets less than QE. And the reason is when you show users three images, there's some self-correction in, right? So if people were looking at two images and were kind of doubtful whether, you know, these are the same breed or not, if they see a third, it might be able to resolve that ambiguity for them. Um, and we'll see this. And so in other words, we might expect that PT is bigger than PE and QT is bigger than QE. Um, and then the second assumption that we made was that we were seeing the same number of edges, but that would only make sense if the cost of a triangle query was three times the cost of making an edge query, right? Because then I'd see the same number of edges, but that's not clear whether the cost is really three times. And I'll get to this in a moment. Okay. Um, and so to answer these questions, I'm going to look at some generative models for triangle queries. How much time do I have? Um, <coughs> About two minutes. Two minutes. So I'm not going to go through the generative models. Anyway, there are generative models that you can come up with, which are uh, generalizations of the stochastic block model, um, which we call triangle block model and conditional block model, and which I won't go into. But it turns out that if you believe those models, and they make physical sense to me, I didn't go through them, um, you, can, you can quantitatively show that this happens. The fact that out of the eight possibilities, three are not allowed, allows for self-correction. Um, so that's a gain. So you get more reliable edges when you do triangle queries. And then finally, what about the cost? Okay, so again, think of Amazon Mechanical Turk. Suppose when I was doing edge queries, I was you know, giving a dollar for every user who, you know, um, responded to an edge query. Now if I give them a triangle query, how much should I pay them, right? So somebody might say, well, you know, we're seeing three edges. So, you know, don't be stingy, pay them, you know, three bucks. Um, someone else might say, well, they're really only looking at three images as opposed to two. So I'm going to be stingy and I'm only going to give them one and a half dollars. Someone else might come in and say, well, that's not really it. You know, when you were doing edge queries, there were two possibilities. Now there's five. So there's really log five bits of information there. So this is what I should give them, it's about 2.3. So already I have the full gamut between 1.5 and 3. And someone else might say, you know, this is not true either because it's, you know, this log 5.2 was assuming those five responses were equally likely. And if the cluster sizes are different and all, that's not the case. And so you really should look at the entropy of observing, you know, particular triangles over, you know, edges. Um, and then someone else might say, well, no, 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 no. Because this is assuming my workers perfectly identify what's going on. They're going to make errors. And so what I should really look at is how much information their response is giving me about the true triangle. If you think about it, the real cost is really how time it takes for the worker to do a triangle query over how, time, how long it takes them to do this, right? If it takes them 10 times more to do this, you have to pay them 10 times more. So we've done this thing, we've done experiments, and there's one of these five that almost always matches this. 
Does anyone have a hint which one it is? It changes from experiment to experiment. It didn't change from experiment to experiment. That's the thing. So in all our experiments, one of these always matched this. Two. So which one? One. One? The answer is two. And the interesting thing is, so Ashish Goyle from Stanford had visited Caltech a couple of months ago, and he does this kind of stuff for rankings and elections and so on. So he asks people to rank items. He sometimes gives them four items, sometimes eight items. And when I asked him this question, he immediately said the answer is two. Bec and, and so apparently the reason is that when people see they're making these decisions, the bulk of the time is understanding the data. Here they have to absorb three images. In the edge case, they have to absorb two. For example, what Ashish said is if you're ranking four objects, it's true there's four factorial possible answers. If you're ranking eight, there's eight factorial, which is a whole lot more. But it takes people twice as long to rank eight objects as opposed to four. Because they're really, once you've absorbed these eight objects, the ranking time is negligible. And so in everything we've done, this is about 1.5. It's even a little less. Um, so. To summarize this part, when you look at triangle queries as opposed to edge queries, the pros are the edges are more reliable because there's self-correction. Because the cost of a triangle query is less than three times the cost of an edge, you actually see more edges for the same cost. In fact, you see twice as many if you normalize to the costs. The cons are, of course, the edges are not independent. But in everything we've seen, both simulation-wise and in empirical evidence, suggests that the pros really outweigh the cons. And so let me show you some empirical evidence. I'll try to wrap up quickly. Um, so we did this both for dogs and birds. Um, so when we had 300 workers looking at edges, we see about 7.7% .7 of the edges. The error rate is 25%. When you normalize, say, to the cost, you get to see twice as many edges. And the probability actually of an edge error you know, in both cases here, drops from 25% to 20%, which is what we were suggesting, that the edges are more reliable. For the birds, it's something similar. It goes from 14% error to about 11%. Um, and so then we did the clustering. I'm short on time. It works better, is the bottom line, when you, when you um, whether it was the birds or the dogs. I'm short on time. I have minus five minutes? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So, um, I could go on ad nauseum because I did triangles and I could do quadruple, which I won't do. Um, but I, I want to say that there is another angle to look at this, which I think, which gets to the information theoretic stuff, which I'm not proud of, but I'll just set the stage. There's a way to look at this, okay? So if you look at crowdsourcing, what do we have? We have items that we want that are drawn from some finite alphabet, say dog breeds, which we want to label. There's a taskmaster who assigns queries and, uh, or constructs queries and assigns them to the crowd. There's a crowd with imperfect skills, which makes errors in responding to these queries. And there's a crowd sourcer who tries to analyze the data. And if you're an information theorist, this maps perfectly to what you're used to. The items are like a source. The taskmaster who makes the queries is like an encoder. The crowd is like a noisy channel. The crowd sourcer is like a decoder. And so the question of interest is if I have a fixed budget and I want a certain fidelity, how many queries should I ask, right? Um, and you can put it into this framework, which we've done, and I'm not proud about the results because the assumptions are kind of weak. I won't go into it. But there is a connection to joint source channel code. Um, so I think I'll stop here. And if you want, I'll answer the question. But uh, otherwise, I can take questions. Or I can answer my own question. What's the answer? What's the answer? So the answer is the Archimedean spiral. Um, does that make sense? Well, this is the Archimedean spiral, right? Um, why is the answer the Archimedean spiral? Um, so what is the Archimedean spiral, right? It has this equation. I guess radius is equal to angle, something like this. Um, and so it turns out, and I'll let you do this exercise. So if I'm given this, uh, this source S, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set theta to be equal to square root of SNR times S. And then I'm going to look at this Archimedean, you know, whatever. And I'm going to choose whatever theta I got. 
And then I'm going to look at the x1 and x2 that I get from here. And that's going to be my first transmission. That's going to be my second transmission. And my claim is that if you transmit like this, SNR goes not to 2SNR, but to SNR square. I'll, you know, I'll leave it for the talk in the fall or whatever we're doing this. Or I'll, it's an exercise you guys can do. But I was, um, I was talking to a neuroscientist at Intel whose name I forget now, a Berkeley neuroscientist. And when I told him this, he said the brain does this. I don't know if the brain does this, if there's an archimedial spiral in the brain. But. Anyway, so this kind of shows being a little bit clever is better than just transmitting to probably related to the analog or error correcting code stuff you're doing? I, Space I, filling I, curves. I and yeah. it, it, it does help. <coughs> Thank you. So you got one plus epsilon of a talk. Can you prove question or two? Let's start with the, with the um, clustering problem. So we have the case passes, the case passes cut. It's kind of similar, it's supposed also to solve this problem when you want to cluster, uh, to have k clusters such that you no know, minimum NIAC edge between the clusters. Okay. And I wonder how these problems are related. Do you know any connection? Because the solutions seem similar, at least in the toy example. Well, so that's assuming you know the entire graph. So uh, again, so I haven't thought about that problem. I'm sure there's probably a connection. I'm not sure this would be the relaxation I would do if that's what, I would, what my objective would have been. Um, so I don't really have much to say beyond that, but I haven't really, I mean, it sounds like there's a connection. Yes, the spasic cast is exactly hard and everything, and this sounds to be very easy. But no, I don't, so I wouldn't say this is easy to, so again, NP hard to me, so, uh, you know, as an idiot, you know, talking about stuff NP hard. Um, to me, it seems, you know, when we say NP hard, what's of interest is to kind of get away from NP hard. You know, and so I think the moral of this story is that if the cluster sizes are, you know, larger than root n, and you know, if these conditions hold, then it's not an NP hard problem. It's a problem. Yes, it's a right. So, but but in in general, yes. I mean, if I ask in general for this problem, of trying to identify clusters, it's probably as hard as hard can be. But the connection between the problems is not clear. The case of passes and this. Let's well, take I mean, it. Let's yes. Take it offline. Yes. Okay. Right. Thank you very much.